Chapter Three of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: A Letter to Nemedia. The savant Astraeus, traveling in the east in his never tiring search for knowledge, wrote a letter to his friend and fellow philosopher Alcimedes in his native Nemedia which constitutes the entire knowledge of the Western nations concerning the events of that period in the East, always a hazy, half-mythical region in the minds of the Western folk. Astraeus wrote in part, You can scarcely conceive, my dear old friend, of the conditions now existing in this tiny kingdom since Queen Taramis admitted Constantius and his mercenaries, an event which I briefly described in my last hurried letter. Seven months have passed since then, during which time it seems as though the devil himself has been loosed in this unfortunate realm. Taramis seems to have gone quite mad, whereas form formerly she was famed for her virtue, justice, and tranquillity. She is now notorious for qualities precisely opposite to those just enumerated. Her private life is a scandal, or perhaps private is not the correct term, since the Queen makes no attempt to conceal the debauchery of her court. She constantly indulges in the most infamous revelries, in which the unfortunate ladies of the court are forced to join, young married women as well as virgins. She herself has not bothered to marry her paramour Constantius, who sits on the throne beside her, and reigns as her royal consort, and his officers follow his example, and do not hesitate to debauch any woman they desire, regardless of her rank or station. The wretched kingdom groans under exorbitant taxation, the farms are stripped to the bone, and the merchants go in rags, which are all that is left them by the tax-gatherers. Nay, they are lucky if they escape with a whole skin. I sense your incredulity, good Alcibiades. You will fear that I exaggerate conditions in Kauran. Such conditions would be unthinkable in any of the Western countries, admittedly, but you must realize the vast difference that exists between West and East, especially this part of the East. In the first place, Kauran is a kingdom of no great size, one of the many principalities which at one time formed the eastern part of the Empire of Koth, and which later regained the independence which was theirs at a still earlier age. This part of the world is made up of these tiny realms, diminutive in comparison with the great kingdoms of the West, or the great sultanates of the farther East, but important in their control of the caravan routes, and in the wealth concentrated in them. Kauran is the most southeasterly of these principalities, bordering on the very deserts of eastern Shem. The city of Kauran is the only city of any magnitude in the realm, and stands within sight of the river which separates the grasslands from the sandy desert like a watch-tower to guard the fertile meadows behind it. The land is so rich that it yields three and four crops a year, and the plains north and west of the city are dotted with villages. To one accustomed to the great plantations and stock farms of the west, it is strange to see these tiny fields and vineyards. Yet wealth in grain and fruit pours from them as from a horn of plenty. The villagers are agriculturists, nothing else. Of a mixed aboriginal race, they are unwarlike, unable to protect themselves, and forbidden the possession of arms, dependent wholly upon the soldiers of the city for protection. They are helpless under the present conditions. So the savage revolt of the rural sections, which would be a certainty in any western nation, is here impossible. They toil supinely under the iron hand of Constantius, 
and his black-bearded Shemites ride incessantly through the fields with whips in their hands like the slave-drivers of the black serfs who toil in the plantations of southern Zingara. Nor do the people of the city fare any better. Their wealth is stripped from them, their fairest daughters taken to glut the insatiable lust of Constantius and his mercenaries. These men are utterly without mercy or compassion, possessed of all the characteristics our armies learn to abhor in our wars against the Shemitish allies of Argos. Inhuman cruelty, lust, and wild beast ferocity, the people of the city are Koran's ruling caste, predominantly Hyborian, and valorous and warlike. But the treachery of their queen delivered them into the hands of their oppressors. The Shemites are the only armed force in Koran, and the most hellish punishment is inflicted on any Koranai found possessing weapons. A systematic persecution to destroy the young Koranai men able to bear arms has been savagely pursued. Many have ruthlessly been slaughtered, others sold as slaves to the Turanians. Thousands have fled the kingdom, and either entered the service of other rulers or become outlaws, lurking in numerous bands along the borders. At present there is some possibility of invasion from the desert, which is inhabited by tribes of Shemitish nomads. The mercenaries of Constantius are men from the Shemitish cities of the west, Pelishtim, Anakim, Arkarim, and are ardently hated by the Zuwakers and other wandering tribes. As you know, good Alchemides, the countries of these barbarians are divided into the western meadowlands, which stretch to the distant ocean, and in which rise the cities of the town-dwellers, and the eastern deserts, where the lean nomads hold sway, there is incessant warfare between the dwellers of the cities and the dwellers of the desert. The Zuagirs have fought with and raided Kauran for centuries without success, but they resent its conquest of their western kin. It is rumored that their natural antagonism is being fomented by the man who was formerly the captain of the Queen's Guard, and who, somehow escaping the hate of Constantius, who actually had him upon the cross, fled to the nomads. He is called Conan, and is himself a barbarian, one of those gloomy Sumerians whose ferocity our soldiers have more than once learned to their bitter cost. It is rumored that he has become the right-hand man of Olgerd Vladislav, the Kozak adventurer, who wandered down from the northern steppes and made himself chief of a band of Zuagirs. There are also rumors that this band has increased vastly in the last few months, and that Olgerd, incited no doubt by this Cimmerian, is even considering a raid on Kauran. It cannot be anything more than a raid. As the Zuagirs are without siege machines, or the knowledge of investing a city, and it has been proven repeatedly in the past that the nomads in their loose formation, or rather lack of formation, are no match in hand-to-hand -hand fighting for the well-disciplined, fully-armed warriors of the Shemitish cities. The natives of Koran would perhaps welcome this conquest since the nomads could deal with them no more harshly than their present masters, and even total extermination would be preferable to the suffering they have to endure. But they are so cowed and helpless that they could give no aid to the invaders. Their plight is most wretched. Taramis, apparently possessed of a demon, stops at nothing. She has abolished the worship of Ishtar, and turned the temple into a shrine of idolatry. She has destroyed the ivory image of the goddess which these eastern Hyborians worship, and which, inferior as it is to the true religion of Mithra, which we western nations recognize, is still superior to the devil-worship of the Shemites, and filled the temple of Ishtar with obscene images of every imaginable sort gods and goddesses of the night, 
portrayed in all the salacious and perverse poses, and with all the revolting characteristics that a degenerate brain could conceive. Many of these images are to be identified as foul deities of the Shemites, the Turanians, the Venhyans, and the Ketons, but others are reminiscent of a hideous and half-remembered antiquity, vile shapes, forgotten except in the most obscure legends. Where the queen gained the knowledge of them, I dare not even hazard a guess. She has instituted human sacrifice, and since her mating with Constantius, no less than five hundred men, women, and children have been immolated. Some of these have died on the altar she has set up in the temple, herself wielding the sacrificial dagger, but most have met a more horrible doom. Taramis has placed some sort of monster in a crypt in the temple. What it is, and whence it came, none knows. But shortly after she had crushed the desperate revolt of her soldiers against Constantius, she spent a night alone in the desecrated temple, alone except for a dozen bound captives, and the shuddering people saw thick, foul-smelling smoke curling up from the dome, heard all night the frenetic chanting of the queen, and the agonized cries of her tortured captives, and toward dawn another voice mingled with these sounds, a strident, inhuman croaking that froze the blood of all who heard. In the full dawn Taramis reeled drunkenly from the temple, her eyes blazing with demoniac triumph. The captives were never seen again, nor the croaking voice heard. But there is a room in the temple into which no one ever goes but the queen, driving a human sacrifice before her, and this victim is never seen again. All know that in that grim chamber lurks some monster from the black night of ages, which devours the shrieking humans Taramis delivers up to it. I can no longer think of her as a mortal woman, but as a rabid she-fiend, crouching in her blood-fouled lair amongst the bones and fragments of her victims, with taloned, crimsoned fingers, that the gods allow her to pursue her awful course unchecked, almost shakes my faith in divine justice. When I compare her present conduct with her deportment, when I first came to Koran seven months ago, I am confused with bewilderment, and almost inclined to the belief held by many of the people that a demon has possessed the body of Taramis. A young soldier, Valerius, had another belief. He believed that a witch had assumed a form identical with that of Koran's adored ruler. He believed that Taramis had been spirited away in the night and confined in some dungeon, and that this being ruling in her place was but a female sorcerer. He swore that he would find the real queen, if she still lived, but I greatly fear that he himself has fallen victim to the cruelty of Constantius. He was implicated in the revolt of the palace guards, escaped and remained in hiding for some time, stubbornly refusing to seek safety abroad, and it was during this time that I encountered him and he told me his beliefs. But he has disappeared, as so many have, whose fate one dares not conjecture and I fear he has been apprehended by the spies of Constantius. But I must conclude this letter and slip it out of the city by means of a swift carrier pigeon, which will carry it to the post whence I purchased it, on the borders of Koth. By rider and camel train it will eventually come to you. I must haste before dawn. It is late, and the stars gleam whitely on the gardened roofs of Kauron. A shuddering silence envelops the city, in which I hear the throb of a sullen drum from the distant temple. I doubt not that Taramis is there, concocting more devilry. But the savant 
was incorrect in his conjecture concerning the whereabouts of the woman he called Taramis. The girl whom the world knew as Queen of Calron stood in a dungeon, lighted only by a flickering torch which played on her features, etching the diabolical cruelty of her beautiful countenance. On the bare stone floor before her crouched a figure whose nakedness was scarcely covered with tattered rags. This figure Salome touched contemptuously with the upturned toe of her gilded sandal, and smiled vindictively as her victim shrank away. "'You do not love my caresses, sweet sister?' Taramis was still beautiful, in spite of her rags and the imprisonment and abuse of seven weary months. She did not reply to her sister's taunts, but bent her head as one grown accustomed to mockery. This resignation did not please Salome. She bit her red lip and stood, tapping the toe of her shoe against the floor, as she frowned down at the passive figure. Salome was clad in the barbaric splendor of a woman of Shushan. Jewels glittered in the torchlight on her gilded sandals, on her gold breastplates, and the slender chains that held them in place. Gold anklets clashed as she moved. Jeweled bracelets weighted her bare arms. Her tall coiffure was that of a Shemitish woman, and jade pendants hung from gold hoops in her ears, flashing and sparkling with each impatient movement of her haughty head. A gem-crusted girdle supported a silk shirt so transparent that it was in the nature of a cynical mockery of convention. Suspended from her shoulders and trailing down her back hung a darkly scarlet cloak, and this was thrown carelessly over the crook of one arm and the bundle that arm supported. Salome stooped suddenly, and with her free hand grasped her sister's disheveled hair, and forced back the girl's head to stare into her eyes. Taramis met that tigerish glare without flinching. "'You are not so ready with your tears as formerly, sweet sister,' muttered the witch-girl. "'You shall wring no more tears from me,' answered Taramis. "'Too often have you reveled in the spectacle of the Queen of Kauron, sobbing for mercy on her knees.' I know that you have spared me only to torment me. That is why you have limited your tortures to such torments as neither slay nor permanently disfigure. But I fear you no longer. You have strained out the last vestige of hope, fright, and shame from me. Slay me and be done with it, for I have shed my last tear for your enjoyment. You she-devil from hell! You flatter yourself, my dear sister, purred Salome. So far it is only your handsome body that I have caused to suffer, only your pride and self-esteem that I have crushed. You forget that, unlike myself, you are capable of mental torment. I have observed this when I have regaled you with narratives concerning the comedies I have enacted with some of your stupid subjects. But this time I have brought more vivid proof of these farces. Did you know that Kralides, your faithful counselor, had come skulking back from Turan and been captured? Taramis turned pale. What? What have you done to him? For answer, Salome drew the mysterious bundle from under her cloak. She shook off the silken swathings and held it up. The head of a young man, the features frozen in a convulsion, as if death had come in the midst of inhuman agony. Taramis cried out as if a blade had pierced her heart. Oh, Ishtar! Kralides! I! He was seeking to stir up the people against me, poor fool, telling them that Conan spoke the truth when he said I was not Taramis. How would the people rise against the falcons, Shemites, with sticks and pebbles? Bah! Dogs are eating his headless body in the marketplace, and this foul carrion shall be cast into the sewer 
to rot. How, sister, she paused, smiling down at her victim, have you discovered that you still have unshed tears? Good. I reserved the mental torment for the last. Hereafter I shall show you many such sights as this. Standing there in the torchlight with the severed head in her hand, she did not look like anything ever born by a human woman in spite of her awful beauty. Taramis did not look up. She lay face down on the slimy floor, her slim body shaken in sobs of agony, beating her clenched fists against the stones. Salome sauntered toward the door, her anklets clashing at each step, her ear pendants winking in the torch glare. A few moments later she emerged from a door under a sullen arch that led into a court, which in turn opened upon a winding alley. A man standing there turned toward her, a giant Shemite, with somber eyes and shoulders like a bull, his great black beard falling over his mighty silver-mailed breast. She wept. His rumble was like that of a bull, deep, low-pitched, and stormy. He was the general of the mercenaries, one of the few even of Constantius's associates, who knew the secret of the queens of Koran. Ay, Kumbanagash, there are whole sections of her sensibilities that I have not touched. When one sense is dulled by continual laceration, I will discover a newer, more poignant pang. Here, dog! A trembling, shambling figure in rags, filth, and matted hair approached, one of the beggars that slept in the alleys and open courts. Salome tossed the head to him. Here, deaf one! Cast that in the nearest sewer. Make the sign with your hands, Kumbanigash. He cannot hear. The general complied, and the tousled head bobbed, as the man turned painfully away. Why do you keep up this farce? rumbled Kumbanigash. You are so firmly established on the throne that nothing can unseat you. What if Karunai fools learn the truth? They can do nothing. Proclaim yourself in your true identity. Show them their beloved ex-queen, and cut off her head in the public square. Not yet, good Kumbanigash. The arch-door slammed on the hard accents of Salome, the stormy reverberations of Kumbanigash. The mute beggar crouched in the courtyard, and there was none to see that the hands which held the severed head were quivering strongly. Brown, sinewy hands, strangely incongruous with the bent body and filthy tatters. I knew it! It was a fierce, vibrant whisper, scarcely audible. She lives! O oh, Kralides, your martyrdom was not in vain. They have her locked in that dungeon. O oh, Ishtar, if you love true men, Aid me now. End of chapter 3